All right, good morning. I'll give you just a second to find your seats as we get started. So a public service announcement to get us started. If you lost an earring, it'll be up here on the podium. No, it's not. So if you lost an earring, it'll be up here. So I'm going to lay it up here on the side. All right, um, so a few announcements as we get started. First of all, we're collecting food uh, during April and May for the Baptist Children's Home of North Carolina. So if you can bring uh, those in, um, we've got a little buggy back here in the back for you that you can put those in. We'd appreciate that. <clears throat> also, Rock's meeting tomorrow at 2 o'clock over at the FLC. So Rock's remember that meeting tomorrow. Uh, also, remember the, the ladies' uh, fellowship night um, on the 26th, and uh, if, you, if you're a graduate, uh, whether that be high school, college, some type of certification, uh, we're going to recognize our graduates on May the 19th, so if you have a name of someone you would like to be recognized, uh, then please give that to, to Norma and the details so we can make sure that those folks are recognized. And our youth retreat is right around the corner, so youth, there's a note in there about the, the youth retreat. Uh, so that'll be June the 18th through the 22nd, somewhere in the mountains, uh, which is no surprise there. So uh, just a few prayer needs. So Geraldine Elliott is having some surgery this week, so be in prayer for her. Continue to pray for Darren. He had surgery this past week on his knee. Um, and uh, so be in prayer for him as he continues to heal. If you recall, he had a tough time with his first knee replacement, so uh, this one seems to be going a little bit better, but keep him in your prayers. Um, and uh, I think that's the announcements that I had. So anything that I missed? All right. Yes, sir. Yes, always. They certainly are. Yep. They definitely are. Good call. All right. Well, let's uh, prepare our hearts for worship if you but Stanley, do you have something? Oh, please. Yeah, welcome. Glad to see you with us. Miss Barber. Awesome. Well, we're so glad you're with us. Please make yourselves right at home. Uh, we're glad you're here. All right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it's uh, uh, it's so great to be in your house today uh, with the sunshine walking in. Uh, just such a, a joy that overcomes you as you walk in the doors of your, your house. And so we're thankful to be here, uh, so thankful for the work that you're, you're doing here and, and the work that you'll do over uh, the time that we'll be together here this morning. Uh, Lord, we uh, just thinking about our missionaries as Grace was updating me on Kinsey and just pray that you'll continue to watch over all of them and continue to, to meet all their needs and uh, just water uh, the seed that's planted uh, that they're doing all across the world. And uh, Lord, we're thankful for their sacrifice in doing so and ask your continued blessing on them. But we lift up these other prayer needs, thinking about Darren, and uh, just pray for continued healing there. Uh, pray for Geraldine as uh, she has a, her procedure this week. Pray that you'll watch over her and, and provide quick healing from there. And I know there's others that I'm missing that I'm not mentioning, and just pray that you'll meet their needs as well. And uh, Lord, help us as we uh, look in Nahum again and uh, study uh, your word this morning that you'll speak through Pastor Joe what we need to hear, that you'll help us to put our total attention on you during this time, and, uh, and that you will receive glory and honor in all that we say and do here this morning. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. So I'll stand, turn to him number 319. 319. <clears throat> Jesus, keep me <clears throat> from their 
Where's the precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in the cross be my joy in heaven till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross a himbling soul love and mercy found me there the bright and morning star shed his beams around me in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross O Lamb of God bring it sings before me help me walk from day to day with its shadows o'er me in the cross in the cross be my glories ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross I watch and wait hoping trusting ever till my reach that golden strand just beyond the river in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river the time to welcome each other
Give number 330, 330. Give number 330. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? You washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you walking daily for the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, for your robes be white. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion bright? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Thank you, yes. uh, Lord, so much for that. Uh, we were without hope, uh, and uh, Lord, with uh, the cleansing power of uh, your blood for our sin, uh, Lord, we have uh, our eternity secured and our hope secured. Lord, bless this time of uh, giving back and our continued worship. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
She follows, she follows my hip. It's all right. <laughs> we've, we've done this for 40 years. She's done it a while. Dave oh, works with two. Okay. Franklin Badgers, <laughs> Mrs. Karen Williams. Beautiful testimony. Okay. I walk by faith and not by sight. <laughs> you just saw that. <laughs> okay. Oh, and by the way, um, red is my favorite color. Well, oh, stop. <laughs> okay, I got to do this so I can get out of here. Um, <laughs> here's the deal Jesus Christ is my Lord and of my life. He didn't used to be. And this is my before and after, okay? Um, I was born at Walter Reed Hospital because my dad was drafted in the Army. So I was born in, in D.C. Um, when I was two months old or three months old, something like that, I was diagnosed with retinoblastoma. That is a tumor in the eyes that is malignant. So that's how I lost those. Um, and I had to say I was pretty blessed because they did it at Walter Reed and that was state of the art. So didn't get any better than that. Okay, so my parents were native Californians. And they moved back to Southern California when I was five. And by then, I had a sister and brother. Um, I grew up there, went to school there and all that. <clears throat> so in my 20s, I moved up to the San Francisco Bay Area, which some of you guys know. And there are lots of earthquakes there. And you'll hear about earthquakes later. But anyway, um, that's where Stuart and I got met and got married. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, we moved to this place called Salisbury, North Carolina. <laughs> and I got this awesome church family. I wonder what that was. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a real blessing. So here we go. Um, I was raised Seventh-day Adventist. Um, in the Seventh-day Adventist system, you keep Sabbath, um, which goes from Friday night to Saturday night. Um, there are certain things you can and cannot do during that time. Um, and also, that is the test of loyalty that you are, your test of loyalty to God. Okay. Um, in the Adventist system, Sunday is the mark of the beast. Um, there is also a health message which really encourages vegetarianism. I'm over that. Um, as far as salvation goes, you really don't know. You're on some kind of probation, and you don't know if you're going to heaven or not, although you're keeping Sabbath and all that ups your, chance, ups your chances. Excuse me, I can't talk. Okay, Jesus is Michael the Archangel, who was a promoted, created being by God the Father. Okay. <laughs> um in San Francisco, I got real disgusted with Seventh-day Adventism. I don't know, really. Can you figure out why? Yeah, and <laughs> and um, so I got into New Age. Um, I was taking yoga, and it, it just went from there. So and in the New Age system, um, there is no sin. You, um, you can find the god or the goddess within. And the sin is that you haven't done that. Um, the universe is worshipped. Jesus, he's a great moral teacher like Buddha. Um, so if you don't find the divinity within, you're, you're in trouble. Okay. Here's my turning point. Here's my after story. In the 90s, um, I was working at a job I couldn't stand. I was working for the DA's office in the county we were living in, in the, in the child support collection. Not fun for me. Um, however, my coworkers who became friends were Christ followers. And they knew I wasn't doing very well. So they invited me to Bible study. And guess what they were studying? They were studying John. <laughs> First one out. and. Um, then 
they, one of my friends invited me to church, and that's where I met the real Jesus. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Here, um, I don't know exactly when I was born again. You know, the wind kind of blows where it wants. But I had to meet Jesus first. That wasn't going to happen until then. So here's my difference. Jesus is my Sabbath rest. Okay? I don't need a day. I need him. Jesus is God. He's not a promoted angel. Is that cool or what? <laughs> and there only, there's only one God, and I'm not him. <laughs> um, I don't, you know, there's no God or goddess. I'm not him. He is him. Okay, and the Bible, um, I got my Bible in here, but anyway. It's a mind expander. Um, didn't used to think it was, but it is. Before Christ, it didn't make any sense to me at all. But now I can't get enough of it. It's God's autobiography. My mind has expanded. Isn't the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? Isn't that where you learn to tell the difference between truth and error? I had none of that wisdom before Christ. God himself, this is my salvation here. God himself paid for my sins 100%, which I could never do. I have eternal life with him. I'm, I'm not on probation. <laughs> I know where I'm going. <laughs> I'm saved. Okay, someone's going to ask me from what? I've heard that before. From, di from drifting along in this life without him. The relief is indescribable. Thank you for letting me share my before and after story. And I hope you guys have a blessed day. You enjoying the testimonies? They are good, aren't they? They uh People have come from uh, some incredible places uh, to find what they always needed, what we all must have, and that, that is the Lord Jesus. And so it's um, interesting to hear the different ways that people get there, you know, get to the Lord. Um, so that's awesome. I read a uh, very surprising thing yesterday, might have been yesterday, but someone in a great position, I mean a huge position, who's remained humble through it all, was asked at a, a, a press conference a simple yet profound question of what defines you as a person. And this person used this opportunity to share their belief in Jesus. And they said, I'm a faithful guy. I believe in a creator I believe in Jesus. Ultimately, I think that's what defines me the most. And I feel like I've been given a platform to compete and, you know, show my talent. It's not anything that I did. I think I set up here a couple of years ago doing the interview after the two, uh, 2022 Masters. And it's like, yeah, I was underprepared for what I was about or for what was about to happen, but I didn't know what to expect, and it's hard to describe the feeling, but I think that's what defines me the most, is my faith, my faith. I believe in one creator, again, that I've been called to come out here, do my best, compete and glorify God, and that's pretty much it. It's the world number one golfer right now, Scotty Scheffler. I thought, what a testimony. So much fun to see somebody give all the glory to God. Amen? From the simple of us to the, well, in that case, the greatest in golf, whatever that means. Uh, pretty big thing to a lot of people, I assume. But, wow. You know, there's a lot of people that are that, and they don't give the glory to anybody except themselves. you got a wonderful singer, wonderful pianist. They don't want any of the glory. They give it to God, right? What a blessing to be among people of faith. Amen.
Just thought I'd share that with you. To me, it's been uh, it's been a great few days. Well, it always is. Every day is a great day because you're either here or you're in heaven if you're in Christ, Amen. and that's it. You know, so uh, I I don't know how I, brother. I don't know how they do without that. How do people live without that? How do they live without the Lord? I don't know. It's incredible. Anyway, looking today at finishing part two of how we see God, how we understand God, what you might call the identity of God, and we're looking at power and mercy. So turn in your Bibles to Nahum. Nahum is after Micah and before Habakkuk. I'm looking for sermon notes. Where'd they go? I had them up here. You get two or three of us walking through here and you get uh, everything gets rearranged. We all arrange it to our liking, don't we? So let me get that so I can try to get on track. So people had some good comments about the notes. If you have more comments, we're going to change it here and there. We've got some changes today in how the notes are written and presented to you. But we're in Nahum chapter 1, verse 3b through 7, but let's read 2 through 7. Let's stand together in honor of the reading of God's Word. And we might have read all this last Sunday. I don't remember. We might have just been 2 and 3a. But God is jealous. The Lord revengeth, verse 2. The Lord revengeth and is furious. Still remember preaching through that. The Lord will take vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserveth wrath for His enemies. Verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath His way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of His feet. He rebuketh the sea, He maketh it dry, drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at Him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at His presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before His indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of His anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by Him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knoweth them that trust in Him. Would you be seated as I pray? Once again, Lord, it's, I read this text for, I don't know, maybe the 50th time. I don't know how many times. I've just enjoyed reading it, and I do so again now. And I pray, Lord, that you help us to, uh, to apply this uh, to our hearts in such a way that it changes, you know, it helps and enhances our walk with you. Lord, if there's anybody here today that's not saved, I pray that conviction will fall on them, well, like one of these rocks, but I, I pray it be in an emotional way, in a spiritual way, it'll fall on them in such a way that they'll want to repent and come to you and seek forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, number one, as we noted last week, there was a huge, uh, there's a huge amount, there's a there's a crisis of not knowing the true identity of God. And that means there's a huge amount of misinformation that contributes this misinformation about God to people's confusion about God. They don't know His character. They don't know His identity. They don't know who He is. And number two, the Bible is the only sure and accurate revelation of our Creator, who is the one and only, the true God. He's the one that we will be held accountable for our sins, this, the God of the Bible. And our only hope, again, our only hope is knowing Him and, and, and having a relationship with Him, a relationship where true worship can occur, true praise can happen an honor that he demands we learn how to give. Those are so important. So important. Now last week we focused on his rock solid justice. Number three. His rock solid judgment. How it will be 100% true a hundred percent, and how no one in sin shall escape the wrath of the judgment of God. 
And we read it again. He will not at all acquit the wicked, right? So that was last week. Number four, today we will see that God has, wow, just incredible power. Incredible power. He promises judgment and His incredible power will bring about the, the ability for Him to execute that judgment on all sinners and on all sin. We will also see that God, again, still under number four, has an incredible mercy. I mean, a mercy without end for those that are true believers in Jesus Christ, His Son. So, God's mercy provides, as we read in the text, a refuge. It provides a safe haven. A place where you can not have to endure His wrath, but instead be embraced by His love and His mercy through His Son, Jesus Christ, through those who believe in Him, they have this. They have this safe haven. They believe in Christ as their Savior. They trust Him to forgive their sins. They confess all their sins to Him. And through that relationship, that salvation, He becomes a, a safe harbor, a place to hide, a place away from the wrath of God. Now, that brings us to Roman numeral 1 and the power of God. As we've already read in First Nahum, or excuse me, first name, in Nahum, uh, chapter 1 is what I meant, first chapter. And we see a whirlwind. That's A, capital letter A, the whirlwind. Now this, number one, is a poetic display, in my opinion, of His power. It's a beautiful display of His power. It's majestic in that the clouds are the dust of His feet. What does that mean? The clouds are the dust of His feet. Well, that, that means that his throne or his seat where he sits in heaven is in a place so that the clouds are his footstool. It's the floor underneath the throne. That's what it means. The clouds. Now, I don't know about you, but the clouds aren't the dust of my feet. Hey, there may be some dust in my feet from time to time. Maybe Norma didn't get the vacuum cleaner out every day. Seems like she gets it out every day. Maybe it was right after that, or right before that. But anyway, that's incredible. The clouds are not my footstool. We think about God's control and where He sits. We think about, number two, how Jesus controlled a storm at sea, right? In John chapter 6, He not only made the wind stop and the waves level out, but He told the boat to get to shore and it was there that instant. I mean, you're talking over two miles. I don't know if you've ever been on a boat in a lake or a sea or whatever. They don't cover ground that fast. One, one point you're two to three miles out, and the next second you're at short, that, that's zero to second in what, brother? Not even your Cadillac's that fast. <laughs> Got one of the big V8 engines, poor Karen, I feel sorry for her. Throw them back against the, you do warn her, right, before you punch that thing, right? You don't warn her? <laughs> do you warn the dog? I mean, you got to warn somebody. But I mean, even that, even the fastest dragster in the world is not going to get you from two miles out in the water to shore, but Jesus Christ can, because He's God, and God has that kind of power to control the sea. Then back in Exodus 19, God appeared Wow, in a mountain of fire and smoke. Part of me wishes I'd been there to see that. Part of me is like, I'm glad I didn't. You know what I mean? It's incredible. He appeared in a, in a mountain of fire and a mountain of smoke. Wow. He also in the Old Testament appeared in the wind. He appeared in the whirlwind. So our proper thought, our proper understanding about God is that He is far above us in every way. He, he moves through the atmospheric heavens at will. And that is the first witness of His power in verse 3. The heavens declare, in other words, the atmosphere declares, the space declares His glory. 
So, number four, clouds in Scripture, just to touch back on that for a second, are often connected with judgment. Clouds are connected with judgment. Jesus is coming back in the clouds on the last day. The angel, Acts 1-9, as you see, saw Him leave, He's coming back in judgment. Then you get a B in your outline, the tribulation. You know, people should look at the heavens and know that God is real because He has so much power over the heavens. And we're taught in Revelation, as we study on Sunday nights in the book of Revelation, that they're going to completely collapse by the power of God. I mean something catastrophic, and you've got three texts there in your notes, so we'll look at one of them because of time. And that's uh, the first one, Revelation 6.12 And you see, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Keep reading. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken in a mighty wind. Well, keep going. Verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled up together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. You get the picture? You're going to see similar things in chapter 8 and verse 12 of Revelation. Chapter 16, verse 8. You can go back. And you've got it there in your notes. You can go back and look at it later. But I mean, wow. That, that's just incredible. This power that God has. Then you go power from that uh, power of the heavens to power sea over the sea, the oceans. And that's Nahum 1.4. And we remember again how we noted in John 6, God's command of the sea. You, you, you see it again in, in Mark chapter 4. We're not going to read that. That's another place where Jesus told the sea to calm down. And it did. It just... You know, science can explain the hydraulic forces that make the waves. And they can, uh, they can explain the atmospheric conditions that makes the wind blow. We know how and why the wind blows. But we are powerless to stop either one of those things. If we're living on the coast, anywhere near the coast, we know that a hurricane is coming. The best we can do is board up the windows, fill sandbags, and try to keep the water out. But we cannot stop that wind nor those waves. We have no power. We're powerless. But God has all power. He can do that. And then D, He has power over the earth, as Nahum explained to us in the second part of Nahum 1, verse 4. And He explained it this way. Bashan, or Bashan, Carmel, right? Carmel, Lebanon. That's the northern, western, and eastern boundaries of Israel. And they are the most fertile areas in that region, maybe in the world. I mean, these, these places grew groceries like you wouldn't believe. They gave us an example of a cluster of grapes that had to be tied on a pole that two men carried, one in, one in, uh, and to the ground. I've never seen a cluster of grapes like that. And I've eaten a lot of clusters of grapes. Amen? I love grapes. That tells you how fertile the fertile crescent is. God says, I can wipe that out in a second. I can snap my fingers and it's gone. Speak the word, whatever you want to say, how you want to express it. God moves and that's done. No more food, no more making money, which they made plenty of great gobs of money off the surplus of food, selling it to other people. No, I can. Just like that, it's gone. Just like He created earth for man in Genesis, but when Adam sinned, God cursed the earth, right? Just like that. I mean, in an instant, with a word, He cursed the earth. And He drove them out of paradise. And God in the end will destroy Revelation 8, 7, you don't have to turn there. He'll destroy a third at first of the heavens. But as you read, in the one text we did read, chapter 6, how many catastrophic things 
Stars falling like figs. Basically the collapse of the heavens. So he has power over earth and power over heaven. Nahum says the mountains will quake. The hills will melt. We've all seen landslides on the news on TV, and they are terrifying. How can, the, how can the world move like that? How can the mountain move like that? And how many of us have driven up the interstate through Asheville up to Pigeon Forge, or maybe from Hickory to Lenore to Banner Elk and Boone, and you get to a very steep place, and you're likely to see something that's interesting. What is it? That's it. And you'll see fencing laid flat on the ground, on the hills, on the steep hillsides, right? Fencing interwoven together, anchored, so forth and so on. You'll see places uh, where they build barriers, hoping to keep those rocks off of the road so that it doesn't hit your Subaru when you drive by, right? Because the hills move. But can you imagine when God shakes them? Oh, my. Woo! See, he has the power over the earth. He has the power to do that. Matter of fact, Nahum 1 5 says, The mountains will quake, the hills melt. And again, we've seen this. This is in not only scripture, but it's in life. But one day they're going to move and practically melt. That's God's power. You got a notation there in your notes about the word Nasa. Burned is actually Nasa in the Hebrew, and it means to lift up. That means it's an earthquake, a shaking, the kind that lifts up or brings the fire of volcanoes or lava, which burns everything. Whatever the case, it's a shaking, number four, under, your, under D. It's a shaking. His power is seen on the earth, just like Paul saw it in Acts chapter 16, right? He's sitting in jail. What does God do? He shakes the jail, doesn't he? He shakes the earth around the jail. What happens to the jail? It just dissembles. However you say that, it dissembles. The rocks that it were built off come tumbling down. Doesn't hurt anybody. Paul's sitting there, right? The jailer and his family made it through, and he's about ready to harry carry. You know what that means, right? He's going to commit suicide. Paul said, whoa, whoa. Hang on, we're all here. See, if he loses all the prisoners, they're going to take his life for theirs, right? Paul leads them to the Lord. But the point is, God shook that place. And when God shakes something, it comes loose. It absolutely comes loose. Jesus died, the earth shook. Jesus rose from the grid, the earth shook, right? God shake this place anytime he wants to. He has incredible power. Then E, who can stand that? Verse 6. Who can stand? That's a great question. Nobody. Number one under E, nobody can stand against the power of God. I mean, he is angry over those who reject his son. His fury comes up in his face as we saw uh, last week. He gets, like we do, red-faced. <laughs> and that's, a, again, an anthropomorphic expression. It's putting a human trait on God. That, it, it just gives us a way to understand that that's not God. But he will have that fury of judgment, however you want to see it. The Bible describes it like you and I, losing our temper beyond reason. Now, if nobody can resist when God becomes, when, when God gets ready to move, nobody can resist, listen to me. Let me ask you something. Are you sitting there today, listen to me, thinking that you have a plan? Come on now. You got a plan? That there's some way that you and your mind have worked out. I've done this. We've all done this. But are you still doing this? That you've worked out in your mind that you don't have to submit to God. You've got some other way. You don't have to be saved. You don't have to be baptized. No, I don't have to obey Acts 2.38 where the people who were truly convicted of their sin and wanted to come to Christ, they asked Peter, how do we do this? What did he say? Be saved and baptized. 
Right? Acts 2.38. Oh, no, I got another plan. My friend, you will not stand before God with that plan. That's what this is teaching us. I want you to understand that. I know maybe you think, like all of us have at one time, that your sin is not as bad as it was. Hey, I've been working on that. Is that you? You've been working on it. Have you cleaned up your act? Good. You stop this sin or you stop that sin? Good. And you say to yourself, now all is right with God? Not good. Do you hear me? Not good. At least not good enough for God. Might be good enough for your, your spouse or your child or your friend or your coworker, but it ain't good enough for God. No, my friend, you have to come to the Lord in His way. You don't get rid of this little sin here and that little sin there or even the big sin. You have to get rid of all sin. Jesus is the standard here, right? He had nothing to stop, no bad habit, no sin to stop and improve his life. He didn't have to go get a book to teach him how to do that, right? So there's nothing that Jesus had to do to clean up his life. He's already perfect. He's sinless. He's stainless. I mean, from conception to the moment on the cross where he actually took your sin, not his, your sin, my sin, upon himself and nailed it to his cross. So if you can't say that you're sinless, and no one can, listen to me. God only has one plan, my friend, and that is to submit to Him. Seek His Son that He provided. God so loved the world that He gave. You seek His Son, His provision for salvation. Don't make up your own little thing. In our pride, in our flesh, we do that. Don't do that. It is eternally, this eternal death. You're riding the wave of death. You can ride, so to speak, the wave of life in Jesus by faith in Him. That's why God provided the Son. That's why He's there. He's there to save. You say, I got saved. Where did you get saved from? In my case, it was my own stupidity. It was my sin and my stupidity and thinking that I somehow was going to bargain with God until God brought me to my knees and I submitted to him. Do not do that, my friend. Don't go that far. Come on now, right? Amen? Give your heart to him now because there is an unescapable wrath and there is the power of God's judgment. And you see, as you see there in your notes, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 through 29. You'll want to see this scripture. And this is proof that coffee is in the Bible. He brews, right? Chapter 12, you've heard that one before. You hadn't heard that before, had you? You hear smiling and laughing. Hebrews, you know, like brews coffee. Okay. Anyway, my jokes are always sad, aren't they? <laughs> Verse 25. Listen. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spoke or spake on earth, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Who spoke from heaven to you? Jesus Christ. How? In this book. All over this book. That's how he spoke to you. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now... He hath promised, verse 26, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. That's what we're studying on Sunday night. And this word, yet once more, signify if the remaining of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence, and godly fear, for our God is, listen to this, a consuming fire. That's His power. That's, that's power. But thankfully there is mercy. And we'll look at that, number two, in our outline, in your notes. The mercy of God, right? Wow. God's mercy in Nathan, Nathan, uh, Nahum 1.7. You had judgment, you had power, now mercy. And it, A, is an everlasting mercy. And we have to say that the Lord is 
good. All the time. All the time. Amen. In his wrath, God is good. He's always good. In, because in his wrath, he remembers mercy. Even in his wrath, he remembers mercy. And turn over to Malachi. I've got to stop saying and. You don't, don't you? I don't like it when people do those things. They have those little, sometimes it, it distracts me. So I'll, I'll try to stop that. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Y'all probably didn't even notice unless I'd said something. But I'm distracting you. I'm trying to get you pulled in here because you're thinking about lunch. I know what you're thinking about. I am too. I'm thinking about lunch. We can wait another five minutes. This is great scripture. Verse 16, because I'm going to tell you something. Those that know the Lord, their names are written down. Did you know that? There's a book of life. Verse 16, then they that feared the Lord, that's those that, that, that's those that love him, Really love him. The Lord spoke or spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance, that's the book of life right there, was written before him for them that feared the Lord, those are the ones that love the Lord, and that thought upon his name. They didn't just think, you're not just saying, Oh, thank the Lord. No, no, this is what you are, man. You you're defined by this. It's like Aunt Kat said, and that's why I read that to you earlier. Golf doesn't define him. Jesus defines him. That's his identity, his relationship with Jesus Christ. So that, that works in good right now at this moment in this message. So there were people who did love. They, they loved God, they feared, and they wondered if their trust in him could secure them. Is my trust in you going to secure me, God? Nah, that's where you check this out and say, well, there's a book. There's a book. What? There's a book? Yeah, there's a book. You belong to God. Verse 17, and they shall be mine. Who? The children of God, the children that believe, the people that believe in Jesus. They shall be mine, he says, saith the Lord of hosts. And that day when I make up my jewels, and I will, I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serves him. Man, that is beautiful. Verse 18, then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Are you serving God? Are you? I hope so. That's what needs to define you more than anything else in your life. You can be great at anything else you want to be, but you also need to be great at serving the Lord. I'm just telling you what the Bible's saying right here. Black and white. You read it yourself. The next verse, for behold, chapter 4, verse 1, the the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave neither root nor branch. Now, sometimes you can, a burnover leaves, the things will come back. This is going to be such a burnover, that ain't going to happen. That's not going to happen. Wow. And it's describing what happens at the end of time. And the judgments, they're eternal in nature. Both the ones for heaven and the one for hell, they're for eternal in nature. It's rough, I know. But verse 2, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise, listen to this, with healing in his wings. Now, when I came to Christ and my sins were forgiven, let me tell you something, I felt a healing of something Eternal in my spirit and my soul that is astounding. And I've told you before, I cried like a baby because I felt so gloriously refreshed and renewed by the power of God. Nothing I did. No, it was all the Lord. He had healing in his wings for me that day on a tennis court at Montreal College right up the road. Healing in his wings for me. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. New life is what that means. You'll come as new life is what that's trying to express and help us to understand. And I mean, it's, it's, it's great. It's awesome. So let me move on to, ah, come on. Can't get things working up here. Got my hand. Let's just do that right there. To be in your outline, mercy is good. God is good. Whew. Mercy is good. God is good. Have you ever heard somebody say, 
Well, you know, God can't be good. Look at disease. Look at death. Look at poverty. Look at the vast amount of injustices all across the world. Well, the answers to all those things are not that God is bad. The answers to all those things are in the Bible. Like the psalmist in 106 says, God is good. John says there is that he is the light and there is no darkness in him at all. 1 Corinthians 16 says, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Forever. God's goodness is revealed in Christ who said, I am the good shepherd. And he is. The works of God are good. And Psalm 33 says, The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Full of the goodness of the Lord. And don't forget that the Lord causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, doesn't he? You say, why would he do that? The unjust, because he's waiting, giving them time, hoping that they'll come to him in repentance. It's like my hard-headed self took so long. I've baptized people in their 70s in the 35 years of pastoral ministry. And there'll probably be more because some of us are stubborn. I'm the biggest one. But number four, what if God had made everything monochrome or one color? What if we lived in a monochrome world? That may be the good message in the Easter eggs. You say, what? I don't like Easter eggs. You know I'm not big deal, big on Easter eggs. But, you know, an egg kind of symbolizes new life, right? It has the potential of life. And when they're colorful, it makes you think of the joy of the Lord, doesn't it? So he knows. I, anyway, but that's what's experienced by a lot of believers, many believers. Then there's also the fact that God is a refuge in Deuteronomy 33, 27. In the New Testament, you have Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, right? But my God shall supply all my, according to his, right? So God is good. He is a God of mercy. Now I can go back because I have my Bible marked at Nahum. Let me see if I can find Micah and read that verse to you. I might have a little trouble finding Micah because I'm a little confused right now about where Micah's at. I think it's behind Nahum, isn't it? Yeah. Ah, there we go. Ah, you scholars, bunch of good scholars out there. But Micah 7, 18, let's read at least that out of those three. Who is God like unto thee? Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He loves mercy. God loves mercy. So we'll summarize. Judgment, power, mercy. I love verse 7. He knoweth them that trust in him. Just like Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me, and I know them. He has a relationship with them. God has a relationship with those that trust Him. Oh my, all of God's standards are obeyed in one act, my friend, that is faith in the perfect finished work of Jesus Christ. And then you have a relationship with God. Now, I may not be able to have a relationship with put in whatever famous person, but I can have a relationship with the creator of all things. Amen? I mean, if I can lead some of those, somebody in a uh, high profile, whatever, to the Lord, that's one thing. I have no worship for them. I have a worship for the one and only great and true God, and that is our Lord and Savior. Man. Number three, we cannot fit in that's actually number two in your outline. We cannot fit in, we can't fit God into our mold. You're just not gonna, it's not gonna happen. You gotta meet his standards. His frame is eternity. Our frame is dust, right? We are dust, and our only hope is in Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? Fathers, we come to a close with that thought. 
that our only hope is in Jesus. Our only hope is in Jesus. I pray, Father, if there's someone here that has had hope in, well, just whatever, fill in the blank, but it's not the Lord. It's not faith. It's not submission. It's not submission to the Lordship of Christ. It's not seeking the forgiveness of sins through the blood of Christ. Father God, it's not faith. It has to be faith. I pray now that they'll realize that and they'll turn to you in faith, realizing that you can write their name in a book that can't be erased ever. Written in blood. Mm. And Lord, I pray for a stronger relationship. I pray that. Lord, I, I want to be closer, a closer relationship. I want to live for you. And anybody, Lord, that uh, anything that happens, let me, let me instantly repent. Help me to know repentance is the key to walking in right life and right living. It's key to faith. And I pray, Father God, that you help us to realize that. Anybody that's not in that area in their life, would they be so now? And then commit in this altar call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So would you stand with me, turn in your hymns as you're standing to hymn number 480. 480, this is our hymn of invitation. As the Lord leads you, would you come? We'll give an invitation to every service. But you come. Make this come your time. every soul by sin. There's mercy Amen. with come on. the Lord. And he will show Make this your time of decision. Man, I'm going to draw closer to the Lord. I'm going to come and pray. I'm going to get saved. I've never been saved. I've never fully committed to the Lord. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. For Jesus Amen. shed his precious blood, rich blessings to be yes, shown. Lord. Plunge now into the crimson blood that washes white as snow. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you. Save you, he will save you now. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for being here. Lord bless you. Lord bless you. I hear the uh, youth went out on the creeper trail. And the only reason I wasn't first on the creeper trail is because I wasn't there. I don't know who won. Who won the race? Nobody knows. Y'all are having too much fun. Y'all made it. That's important. Well, come, come, brother, and dismiss us in prayer. Hope to see you back tonight. Yes, I think I feel better than them. I'm not bragging, but... <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord, uh, we once again uh, so thank you for this time that you have called us together. We thank you, God, for your word. And uh, Lord, it reminds us how powerful you truly are. Lord, even though you bestow so much grace and mercy in our lives, Lord, a grace and mercy that covers whatever sin we have ever committed, Lord, your steadfast love overwhelms us. So we thank you for that. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we pray that we are great examples of what you've done in our life. Each day we walk out those doors. We love you and again, we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.